Hello, I'm Kim Kerrigan at the headquarters of Bankers Advisory in Belmont, Massachusetts. Did you know when it comes to getting a mortgage, the lender is on the hook? They only have three days to disclose the fees and the terms of a mortgage. Here to discuss the federal and the state regulations that protect consumers is Marissa Blundell. She's general counsel for Bankers Advisory. Marissa, it's great to be with you. I know we're going to talk about disclosures today. And let's get started talking about the qualified mortgage and how that relates to financial disclosure. Well, in order to be a qualified mortgage, the transactions, points, and fees cannot exceed 3% of the loan amount. So the lender is limited in the amount of points and fees they can charge to the borrower. And those points and fees have to be disclosed to the borrower up front. So Marissa, when you're talking about disclosure, um, are you talking about truth in lending? Yes, there are many different state and federal regulations that govern the mortgage origination process. Two of the primary regulations when you're talking about borrower disclosures are the Truth in Lending Act and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. Now, both of those laws require disclosures to be given to the borrower very early on in the process, within three days of the lender's receipt of the borrower's application, and then again at closing. So Marissa, this essentially gives the borrower an opportunity to read all that fine print before they move forward in the process. Yes, the truth in lending disclosure will show the borrower the total finance charge that they're going to incur throughout the loan's term, which could be 30 years. And under RESPA, lenders are required to give the borrower a good faith estimate. That's actually the name of the form. Mm -hmm. And on that estimate, the borrower will see the potential settlement charges that they'll incur at closing. So talk to me a little bit about the good faith estimate and what that does for the consumer. Well, the design of the good faith estimate is such that it uses numeric codes so that at closing, the borrower will very easily be able to compare the charges that are listed on their closing settlement statement and the information that was provided earlier to them on the GFE. And we'll be able to make a comparison to make sure that the, the charges were appropriate. And what if they find out they're not? Well, and that is actually the intention of RESPA is to prevent surprise fees at closing. So let's use some examples. For example, let's say a $200,000 loan. How would this apply? All right, in that scenario, the points and fees that the lender can charge can't be more than $6,000. And so that means that the lender's origination charges, the loan originator's compensation, if it's not a salary, and the third-party fees that are going to be paid to a lender's affiliate cannot be more than $6,000. Marissa, you talked about third-party charges. Now, where would those be coming from? Well, the consumer is going to have costs for, that are necessary for the lender to process the mortgage application. For example, the cost for obtaining a credit report or an appraisal, the cost for the title insurer to run a title search. Those are all considered third-party fees. Well, wouldn't it be difficult to predict the exact cost of these items? I mean, for example, if the house is over on Martha's Vineyard, uh, the appraisal cost might be higher. You're absolutely right. And the appraisal cost could vary based on where exactly the property is located, what type of property is being assessed. And the lender is required to not charge more than they had originally disclosed. They are limited. Only very small increases to charges are permitted at closing. And in the case of the appraisal, that's a 10% um, tolerance cap, so to speak, that's on the increases that could potentially happen. And if it goes beyond that, then is, the, is it the lender's responsibility to pick up that cost? Yes. The, if, if the 10% tolerance threshold is exceeded, the lender would have a legal liability there to either cure the deficiency at closing, which is by reimbursing the borrower. So does that 10% tolerance fee only apply to the appraisal? What about other fees that may be incurred? The 10% tolerance applies to the appraisal fee, credit report fee, all of those fees in aggregate, what we would call the third party fees. Mm -hmm. However, there are other charges, such as the origination charge, that's subject to a 0% tolerance threshold, which means that amount cannot increase at closing from what it had been disclosed as earlier in the process. So they've got to be right on the money when it comes to those uh, different charges. Exactly. If it was 10 cents 
greater at closing than it turned out to have been disclosed earlier, then the lender would have a responsibility to cure that violation. So Marissa, what happens if some of those fees go beyond the 10% that has already been, been stated? If certain settlement charges at closing, which include the appraisal, the credit report, and some other fees that are subject to the 10% tolerance threshold in aggregate, then the lender should really cure that violation at closing or within 30 days of closing, which means they would send reimbursement to the borrower. And if they do that, it's as if the violation never occurred. Okay, but what about the zero tolerance items? The same would apply for a zero tolerance violation. So if the lender happens to be off 10 cents for a zero tolerance item, which includes the origination charge for the loan and a few different other specific charges, then the lender should typically cure that right at closing. Tell me about some of the other disclosures that a consumer may see, you know, the fine print, if you will. What's in that fine print? Well, for example, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act requires that lenders provide certain notices to the borrower as soon as the borrower, within three days of, of applying for a loan. And that would include the, the notice to the borrower that they have the right to receive a copy of their appraisal, and or the lender could actually provide that copy of the appraisal mm -hmm. to the borrower. There's also um, additional notices about anti-discrimination and different borrower rights throughout the process. Now what happens if they don't get all of that disclosure? Well, the, the typical way in which it is noticed that a borrower didn't receive their disclosure would, would be either from the borrower having a complaint about the process or from the lender being examined by whichever regulatory um, agency typically conducts their examination. So there would be evidence of that in the file. Earlier you mentioned that there are state laws. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about some of those state laws and how the consumer benefits. For example, each state is going to have its own legislative agenda, so to speak, and states can always promulgate rules that are stricter than the federal rules or in addition to the federal rules with respect to consumer protection. And for example, in Massachusetts, before a lender can approve a refinance transaction, the lender and the borrower have to complete a tangible net benefit form to ensure that that transaction is going to in fact provide some benefit to the borrower before the lender can make that loan. So tangible net benefit, uh, explain to me why that's so important. I mean it seems pretty obvious, but explain it to me. If after refinancing the borrower's monthly payment for their mortgage will be reduced. Sometimes they're reduced by $100, $150, $200 a month. And if that's the case, that indicates that there's a benefit to the borrower. However, um, there are costs that the borrower will incur as part of that refinancing transaction. And if, for example, it takes a very long time for the borrower to recoup those expenses with the amount of money that they're currently going to save um, with their new monthly obligation, then that may or may not always be a benefit. So it's very important for the lenders to memorialize the benefit to the borrower using that worksheet. And in fact, in some states like Massachusetts, that's actually required. It sounds like to me there's a lot of protection for consumers, both on the federal level as well as the state level. Yes, and the federal agencies are evaluating the Truth in Lending Act and Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. They have for years and they continue to do so in order to hopefully simplify the process further. Well, that sounds like a positive thing for both consumers and lenders.